today. He predicted the rise of Trump. I had the strangest sense that I was dealing with something different. Now he says the president could help our nation fulfill its divine plan. Well, there's your wrecking ball. Plus, New York Times bestselling author Terry Blackstock takes us inside the pages of her latest thriller on today's 700 Club. Well, folks, the news is coming at you fast and furious. Man, hearings with Comey and hearings with the new uh, Supreme Court nominee and uh, the president now today is going to Capitol Hill with a message for congressional Republicans. It's time to fulfill a top campaign promise. Repeal and replace Obamacare. Well, the discussion today comes after the president traveled to Kentucky last night, where he promised to move ahead with his agenda for America. Heather Sells has the story. Thousands stood in line in Louisville to hear the president talk about his push to repeal and replace Obamacare, along with other issues like jobs, trade, and immigration reform. Next to you and defend her. The president is pushing for a vote Thursday in the House, and his remarks last night conveyed a sense of urgency. He promised to move quickly to other important matters, but he says the health care bill has to be passed first. Finally, we want a very big tax cut, but cannot do that until we keep our promise to repeal and replace the disaster known as Obamacare. The president blasted Democrats for jamming Obamacare through Congress seven years ago. But right now, he must convince the most conservative House members in his own party of the merits of his plan. So Republicans are adding last-minute revisions to sweeten the deal. They include a more generous tax credit for older Americans and curbing the future growth of Medicaid. The president says the Republican bill will also lower the cost of medicine. We're going to bring it down. We're going to have a great competitive bidding process. Medicine prices will be coming way down, way, way, way down, and that's going to happen fast. The head of the conservative House Freedom Caucus is already predicting that the repeal plan won't pass. Still, the president plans to court House Republican holdouts on the Hill today. And he promised the Kentucky crowd victory in the and end. Remember, we're going to negotiate and it's going to go to the Senate and back and forth. The end result is going to be wonderful and it's going to work great. Heather Sells, CBN News. Well, the president is a tough negotiator and I think he's going to win on this one. The, the, the Republicans have got to pass this thing. They've got to repeal Obamacare. They've got to live up to their promises. The American people want action and they cannot continue this stuff. I mean, there's only so many deals you can make and only so many concessions you can get before you become an obstructionist and you don't need it. But speaking of obstruction, can you believe the Democrats are going to try to smear this wonderful man, Neil Gorsuch, who's, who's probably the, the most extraordinarily qualified nominee to the Supreme Court we've ever had. He's unbelievable. And on the second day of his confirmation hearings, here's what the story is with John Jessup. Pat, today's hearing expected to be much tougher for Judge Gorsuch after an easier first day of opening statements. But the Trump administration had a more difficult time yesterday in another hearing in the House, where the FBI director addressed Russia's attempts to influence last year's presidential election. Jenna Browder has that story. In my decade on the bench, I've tried to treat all who come before me fairly and with respect. After more than three hours of listening, Supreme Court nominee Neil Gorsuch finally spoke at his confirmation hearing, touting his family and Colorado roots. To my teenage daughters watching out west, bathing chickens for the county fair, devising ways to keep our determined pet goat out of the garden. Monday was the first of four days of hearings for Gorsuch, who's likely to take on the legacy of the late Justice Antonin Scalia. Republican senators stress the importance of this appointment. Arguably the most important thing the U.S. Senate will do this year is confirm the next Supreme Court justice. Still upset about former President Obama's high court nominee, Merrick Garland, who didn't get a hearing from Senate Republicans last year, there were some tense moments for Democrats. Your nomination is part of a Republican strategy to capture our judicial branch of government. 
That is why the Senate Republicans kept this Supreme Court va seat vacant for more than a year. In these opening remarks, lawmakers questioned how Gorsuch would handle issues like Roe versus Wade, the Second Amendment, and immigration. Republicans praised him as a staunch follower of the Constitution. He has the highest level of professional qualifications, including integrity, competence, and temperament. But it's that same originalist commitment that worries some Democrats, who say that if we still follow the Constitution word for word, then we would still have segregated schools and bans on interracial marriage. Women wouldn't be entitled to equal protection under the law, and government discrimination against LGBT Americans would be permitted. At the same time, on the House side, FBI Director James Comey was in the hot seat and confirmed for the first time publicly that his agency is investigating potential links between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. I have been authorized by the Department of Justice to confirm that the FBI, as part of our counterintelligence mission, is investigating the Russian government's efforts to interfere in the 2016 presidential election. Comey testified before a congressional hearing dealing with Russian meddling in the presidential election. House Intelligence Chair Devin Nunes said they haven't found any proof of collusion between Russia and the Trump campaign. The head of the FBI and National Security Agency also contradicted President Trump's claims that Obama ordered wiretapping of Trump Tower before the election. We know there was not a physical wiretap of Trump Tower. However, it's still possible that other surveillance activities were used against President Trump and his associates. NSA Director Mike Rogers added that they didn't uncover any evidence to back up the president's accusation. Both the FBI and NSA held back in releasing details of their investigation until the reports are complete. And in the Senate. We hold different political and religious views but we are united in our love. The Supreme Court confirmation hearings continue through Thursday, with Gorsuch taking questions on the stand today. A vote in the full Senate is expected in mid-April. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. Pat, quite a busy week on Capitol Hill. Well, there's so much at stake. This election was about the, the consequences. The thing that people were concerned about is the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has tilted to the left. They have uh, restricted religion. They have opened the doors to every kind of bizarre sexual activity. Uh, they have uh, literally destroyed the uh, religious framework of our nation. It isn't they've given liberty. They have given license to uh, incredible groups. And you, based on those decisions, Educators particularly have gone on a vendetta against people of faith. It is unbelievable. And now is the chance to change the, the balance. There will be at least two more vacancies on the court without question. Uh, one uh, is, is talking about retiring, although he's in relatively good health, but he's, he's over 80 and he decides it's time to quit. Uh, another is, is an octogenarian, but also extremely ill, and you just wonder, you know, she sleeps during a lot of the hearings and things like that. And sooner or later, this lady is going to have to retire, and that means another uh, vacancy, which would mean, folks, for the next 30 years or so, there would be a Supreme Court that would uphold the Constitution and uphold the founding uh, principles of our nation. It is a very important thing. The Constitution was never intended to be a living document that was at the mercy of the whim of, of, of the uh, uh, political correctness of the day, whatever it happened to be. And I know one judge some years ago said the Supreme Court is whatever the judges say it is. Well, I mean, the Constitution is whatever the, the judges say it is. Uh, that, in my opinion, is wrong. And Antonin Scalia was strong on this. Gorsuch is strong on it. And there are other, I think the next guy coming up is probably going to be William Pryor, uh, who is a distinguished uh, jurist uh, on the circuit uh, down in, uh, in Georgia and uh, in Alabama, wherever it is it's in the South. Um, and I think that uh, he would probably be the next in line. And again, a strict constitutional. We're talking about a major shift in our country, a major shift. And all kinds of good things will flow for me, which means that the Democrats, I mean, the Republicans of the Congress, 
if it takes a so-called nuclear option, they've got to take it. Whatever it takes to get that thing done, they have to do it. The same thing in the House and Senate. They must uh, take charge of the budget. They must bring this incredibly uh, profligate government we've got under control. They've got to do it. Talking about draining the swamp, it's got to be done. Now, we've, the voters have given them this uh, opportunity, and the American people are going to be looking at them and say, now's your chance. You've got to fight for it, and you've got to be strong, and you've got to make it happen. And if it takes tough work, then get tough and talk tough and act tough and make it happen. Whew. So much for that. <laughs> All right, John, what's next? Pat, the United States is boycotting a United Nations Human Rights Council session this week dealing with Israel and the Palestinians. The U.S. says the regular review of Israel shows the council's, quote, longstanding bias against Israel. And U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley made an even stronger statement by pointing out that Israel is on the permanent review list compared to which countries are not. She said it is not Syria where the regime has systematically slaughtered and tortured its own people. It is not Iran, where public hangings are a regular occurrence. It is not North Korea, where the, regimes, where the regime rather uses forced labor camps to crush its people into submission. Rather, it is Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East. The boycott was announced by the State Department, and Pat, this comes as the Trump administration is considering dropping out of the UN Human Rights Council unless serious changes are made. Uh, I think what's got to be done is budget. We've got to cut their flow of money. We pick up about 22 to 25 percent of the budget of the United Nations, and uh, it, it's it's the sounding board for hate against the United States and hate against Israel. Let's cut the money, Terry. Well, coming up, he's called God's chaos candidate, and now he's the president of the United States. Donald Trump is a wrecking ball to the spirit of political correctness. Why one author says Trump is like a modern day biblical king. That's next. Some years ago, President Harry Truman said, I am Cyrus. Imagine that. Why? Well, who was Cyrus? You remember? If you read your Bible, you read the history. Cyrus was a Persian king uh, who helped the Jews rebuild their temple. He was a friend of Israel. Well, some Christians have been saying Donald Trump has a, quote, Cyrus anointing to play a key role in this current or urgent hour of our nation's history. We're going to talk with one Christian leader who believed long before he was elected that Trump would be the next president of the United States. Who? Why? Take a look. In the months leading up to the 2016 presidential election, author and speaker Lance Wallnow was one of several evangelical Christian leaders who believed against all odds that Donald Trump would be the 45th president of the United States. I had the strangest sense that I was dealing with something different. I was dealing with someone who wasn't an evangelical Christian, who was anointed for an assignment. And I didn't know what, where to go with that. So I went home, and all that I heard the Lord say is, Donald Trump is a wrecking ball to the spirit of political correctness. Walnow compared Trump to the Persian king Cyrus cited in the Bible. Cyrus decreed the Jews living in captivity in ancient Babylon could return to Israel and rebuild their temple. Walnow expands on that theme in his book, God's Chaos Candidate, Donald J. Trump and the American Unraveling. Well, how did he know that? Did he have some special anointing? Author and speaker Lance Walner is joining us now. Lance, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Good to be here. How did you know? Well, I went to hear Donald Trump in 2015. Uh-huh. And uh, when I came home, I distinctly heard, and I'm not one of those people that's always hearing God's voice, so it stuck out to me. I heard the Lord say, Isaiah 45 will be the 45th president. Wow. And I... You know, the Bible says try the spirit. So I didn't go to the Bible. I went to Google. I wanted to see if, <laughs> if the next I'm number... sure Google knows more than the Bible. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> so I wanted to know is the next president 45, because I yeah. can fix this right away if okay, it is. Okay, okay. Barack Obama's 44, and I said, well, wait a second. We elected twice. Uh-huh. 
Well, he keeps the same jersey, so it's still exactly. 44. Sure. Then I said, oh, my gosh, the next president is 45th. Right. Then I flipped it open. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, whom I have anointed. That's right. And I'm reading it to break open the two lead gates of mm -hmm. Babylon. But I had just met Trump, and I'll be honest with you. We have a lot of great conservatives at that time running and yeah, Christians. Exactly. And we would like to see Christians and conservatives. And mm -hmm. I wasn't so sure that Donald Trump was an evangelical. He's saying he's a Christian, but I'm saying, I don't know, with a bunch of preachers. We're checking this out. Often married casino operator, uh, <laughs> art of the deal, amazing, exactly. yeah, unbelievable. So yeah. I didn't know. And I, and I, but then I read on in this 45th chapter, it says, Isaiah says, though you have not known me, I have anointed you for Israel's sake. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, though you have not known me, I circled it and I said, my God, this is crazy theology. God's bringing in a heathen ruler mm -hmm. with his anointing who doesn't yet know him, but God's hand is on him. And yeah. then I read on, verily thou art a God that hides thyself. Mm -hmm. And I said, dear God, you have hidden this, <laughs> you have hidden your hand in this unusual man. From that moment on, I said, this guy's going to go the distance. He'll beat all 15. He'll go all the way to the White House. Well, all those other candidates were so strong, and, and Trump seemed so unlikely. So unlikely. Totally unlikely. I mean, I published my book the week the Access Hollywood uh, audio came out. Mm. I thought for sure I was finished. My career was done. My first book and the first, <laughs> and the first week it's launched. I'm, and uh, I, I, I took to a, a, a cell phone. I was in Jerusalem. And I said, look, to all my friends out there that are reading the book, I said, I can only think of one thing. This is the first humbling this man's ever experienced. I mean, he really didn't yeah. have anything he knew to repent of, and now he does. Mm -hmm. I said, why would God allow that to happen unless he's about to get promoted? I said, I believe God's got this. I know that Trump will know it was the hand of God that got him in office right. from this moment forward. Well, the evangelicals went like 83% for him. You know, it's just amazing. And, but we, we haven't had a president in, my, in our lifetime that was so pro-evangelical and has spoken for the, for the issues that evangelicals care about. Gosh. I mean, do you remember that soundbite, that horrendous moment when he was arguing with the Pope? Who gets in a dust-up with the Pope on the campaign trail? <laughs> and he's yelling, I'm a Christian and I'm proud of it. I thought, <laughs> that's got to be God's man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, what do you think? I mean, he's in there now, and it looks like the forces of hell are against him. Oh, but my God. Well, that tells you right away he's, he's, he's anointed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I think that Cyrus, I believe that the, uh, you know, he's 14 points behind before the election. All of my friends in Washington said, the reason why we like your book is you wrote it while he was 14 points behind instead mm -hmm. of coming out with a book after he got in. The fact is, Daniel interceded for a transition in government. Yes. I believe God's people prayed in a miracle. I believe Cyrus is a secular reformer, but not a spiritual reformer. Mm -hmm. I think the next thing that'll happen will be biblical, Ezra. I think Donald Trump's gonna make a proclamation. If, if anyone's capable of an unpredictable utterance, it's Donald Trump. Yeah, sure. Cyrus made a proclamation that authorized the Jews to do something. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think this president's gonna put a demand on people of faith to make a difference in America. Mm -hmm. He's gonna say something. Because it's Ezra that then mobilizes the right. body of Christ at that time right. to move in the direction of something. And then Nehemiah shows up and begins to rebuild the wall. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think that wall of self-government is being restored in America, but it's going to require a move of God. And you've been preaching this for years, Absolutely. an awakening. Absolutely. But this kind of government, this kind of Supreme Court you're talking about can create the skeletal structure for an awakening that can retake territory we've lost for two decades. Well, just think of what he's got in his hand. If he changes the Supreme Court, we're looking at the repeal of Roe versus Wade. The abortion on demand will be curtailed somewhat. The school prayer and all these things will be uh, uh, permitted. There won't be the vendetta against religious groups. I mean, it'll be an amazing reformation. Absolutely. And reformation is the key word. Yeah. Many Christians are looking for a revival. They want to enjoy something of God's presence. But I really believe it's going to be a revival that's going to experience itself in reformation. We have to reclaim institutional presence. Yes. We have to raise a generation. As you've done here with the, your whole life message yeah. is raising up in every sphere of society. That's believers it, to exactly be influential. Right. We have got to have a millennial move mm -hmm. uh, that moves young people into occupying culture. Well, I'm doing that at Regent University. We're training thousands and thousands of leaders. You know, we've got 44 sitting judges now, our graduates, 44. We've got all kinds of Imagine congressmen that. and 
and uh, mayors and city council members and so forth. We, we, we're doing the best we can, but there's more coming. But brother, but yeah, one more time, wrecking ball to political correctness. Talk about that. Absolutely. The, you know, it's, uh, and, and uh, Bannon, Steve Bannon, who is with Trump, yeah. he knows that big Hollywood, big media, big academia, and big government are mm -hmm. all in the same place. Progressives have permeated the gates of influence in those four that, mind molders of influence. Right. That's right. So what, what is happening is Trump simply does not play by their rule book. And mm -hmm. so he's scrambling the game. The wrecking ball is hitting media. We see that. Mm -hmm. He's up against the, uh, the Hollywood uh, system. I believe that God's using him to destabilize these progressive institutions, the penetration of that progressive ideology in these mm -hmm. places, so that believers and other viewpoints can go into them yes. and establish credibility also. What's this crucible you talk about in your book? Well, the crucible is America's had three uh, three moments of great crises in defining itself, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, coming out of World War II and the Depression. Uh -huh. Every 70 or 80 years, we go into a cycle where America hits a defining moment, a crucible. We're actually in this, and it's interesting because Bannon and uh, some Harvard researchers have, you know, guys that have been reading each other's stuff predicted there would be a crisis around this time defining America. Mm -hmm. And I saw that crisis coming economically, and you, and you were speaking about it too. Oh, oh yes, and absolutely. And I knew that if yeah. this election did not go the way that it's going, we would have seen the collapse of this system and then, a, and then the whole, uh, you know, a whole restructuring globally. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the crisis we're in right now isn't over yet. But what we have is somebody that God can use that can create a reset. Mm -hmm. And with that reset, we have an opportunity of sustaining the voice of America for, for who knows how much longer. Yeah, but it's yeah. a cycle of American history, and it's the fourth turning or the fourth crucible. We're so, entering it right now. And the unraveling of America is what you're seeing. All the, mm -hmm. the cacophony of voices trying to redefine who is an American? What is an American? What yeah. is a married couple? What is a, a child? That chaos is where this candidate got sucked in as a president. Mm -hmm. I believe that he, he's going to stand on the side of truth if the church stands up as a force. He believes in the power of the church. Sure. Well, I think it will. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I knew the same thing. I didn't quite know it as you did, but I told people he was going to win. Because I, I couldn't see another eight years of Obama, that this, was, that this nation will no longer exist as we have known it through history. It, it, was, it was in the you know, death throes, and there had to be a change. We could not permit this thing to continue. And, but the people are so upset, they can't stand the thought that Hillary Clinton didn't win, though, because they, you know. Well, everything that's going on now is, hmm. in, I, and you're an experienced observer of this stuff, it's theatrics. It's trying to unravel the credibility of Donald mm -hmm. Trump as a president by implying that somehow it's illegitimate because of Russia. That's right. Now, they have absolutely no evidence. That's right. No evidence that Russia's involved. But they're going to continue that sure. narrative because it's the best story they got to keep on hitting on the <laughs> credibility of him as a president. Well, man, I appreciate you being here, and I appreciate what you've done. And this book, by the way, is called God's Chaos Candidate. What a great title. And uh, Dr. Lance is here with us, and uh, here's the book. It's available where books are sold. Very perceptive. Thank you so much. Thank you. Man. Keep it up. God I'll bless you. you. All right. Terry, what you got next? Well, coming up, she was a gangster rapper who wanted to be as tough as the men, so she started to dress like one. I wanted to be the one that was in control. I wanted the one that had the power. Hear how she was jolted into changing her life. That's next. Welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club. We're delighted to have you with us. We got some good stuff coming. At the height of her career, Venus Burton quit. She had been a star in the underground rap scene, but after years of living a lifestyle consumed by hate, she finally found true love. And here's Venus's story. People today know Venus Burton as a Christian rapper. I'm free, I'm free. So a little rap into it. No more shackles, no more chains. No more shackles, 
No more chains. There was a time no people chains. knew her by a different name. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your girl, Lucy Love. They would call me Booski, Booski Love. Now, that was one of my rapping names. It's called the Underground Rap, Gangster Rap. I was more of an outlaw. It's like, well, you don't mess with me. I won't mess with you kind of thing. And so in my songs back then, there was a lot of pain that I went through. Venus grew up in Southern California. She lived with her brother, Kenny, and her single mom, Vicky, who worked several jobs. They didn't see a lot of their mother or wayward father. Well, I always wanted to be a daddy's girl. And I thought that I was cheated. Why can I have that? Why can I have a father? And so that caused me to rebel, and I got angry, and those different emotions began to control my life. Venus was 13 when her mom gave her life to Christ and started taking them to church. At the same time, Venus also started rapping, which helped vent her anger. I had to um, pour it out or, you know, to empty myself, to get rid of it. So I would do it in the music you know, to get that relief or to get that satisfaction that I was yearning for. By 16, Venus was drinking often. She also decided to hide her feminine side. Because it shows the soft side of me. It shows the emotions. It showed um, things that I was going through, the hurt and the pain that I was going through, that I was dealing with. She started changing the way she cut her hair and the clothes she wore. She looked and acted more like a man with each passing day. Because I wanted to be that aggressive one. I wanted to be the man role. I wanted to be the one that was in control. I wanted the one that had the power. After two years, the transformation was complete as Venus became attracted to women. In this lifestyle, I was accepted. You know, so I found acceptance. I found that security. Venus continued as an underground rap artist, her popularity growing each year. In the meantime, she had numerous relationships with women, and all ended badly. The loneliness, the portrayal of friends, and people that I thought that loved me so much, or even being in a relationship, I was drinking so much that I would black out, uh, didn't know places that I was, and I found myself in some really dark places. All this time, her mom, Vicki, prayed continually for her daughter, hoping she'd find a way to Christ. There was times I would go and put on her shoes and walk and pray in them, you know, just maybe take the anointing all, go anoint her room, you know, and just believe God. At times, Venus also reached out to God. There was something in me that I will always pray to God, seeking God. I know you're real, but I need you to show up. I need you to show up now. You know, I'm tired. I'm tired of, of being who I was. Didn't know how to get out. Didn't know if it was a way to get out. Up to 5,000 birds just fell from the sky. In the One afternoon, of while watching an alarming story on the news, Venus thought the world was coming to an end, as well as her life. Like half an hour later, I remember it said, you know, God, save me. Save me from this lifestyle. I need you to take this away from me. And as I prayed to God, he instantly took away the desire of wanting to sleep with a woman. His love and his compassion for me, I just felt so much lighter. I felt free. I mean, I felt like the chains were broken off of my life. It took time, prayer, and God's healing. But Venus embraced her identity as the woman God created her to be. In my process, he was unveiling, unpeeling me, just like an onion, you know, every layer every hurt, every pain that I was going to, every disappointment, and they were just coming off one by one. 
Venus and her mom joined forces and ministered to hurting people through their radio show. In the basement, we're talking with B.O.B. I am your host. That emptiness, the void that I was missing, Jesus, he, 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 he fulfilled that, that void, that, that emptiness that I was feeling in my heart. He filled it with his love, his love and his compassion for me. And that was really um, the ultimate healing for me to have God Almighty as my father. Our hearts are restless till they rest in thee. You know, Venus was like so many, they're searching for something. She thought she could do it by expressing hate, rap songs, hate. I hate things. I hate myself. And she thought she could do it by changing an identity. She's no longer a woman. She's a man. Now she's going to be acting out with women instead of uh, with uh, members of the other sex. That's what she was going to do. She was caught up in a lesbian lifestyle, caught up in the rap scene, caught up in all of that, always seeking because what she really wanted was the love of a father. And you know, the ultimate love is the heavenly father, God Almighty. We can't even dream of the love that he has for us. His love is boundless. And the nice thing about it is that he overlooks all of the sin. You see, when, when Venus called on him, he didn't say, what's this? You've been saying nasty things about me. You've been filled with hate. You've been having sex with women. It's terrible. You know, you don't deserve to come in here. She didn't, he didn't say that to her. He said, well, welcome home, daughter. You're part of my family. And now I'll make you a true child of God. That's what he'll say to you, because he loves you. D -d don't turn him down anymore. D don't say, no, you don't understand. It's more fun to be angry. Venus said, take this away from me, and God will take the bad stuff away from you. Pray with me. If you want, if you want the love of a father, pray with me right now. Bow your head. Say these words and say them from your heart. Jesus, that's right, Jesus, you know me. You know the terrible things I have done and who I am. But Lord, I want to be free from all of that. I want to be part of your family. Lord, come and fix me. Bring me into the relationship with you because I receive you as my father I receive Jesus as my Lord. I receive him as my Savior. And from this moment on, I am yours. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, if you prayed with me, I want to give you something. It's called A New Day. It's a little packet. I did a 73-minute teaching on what happens next. What, what, what do you do? Well, this is very helpful for you, and I'll give it to you free. You say, well, what do I just, I just prayed that prayer, what do I do next? Well, that, this thing will tell you what to do next. Pick up the telephone, call in. It's a free number. It's easy to remember. It's 800 and it's 700, 7,000. 700, 7,000. Somebody's here who loves you. Call right now. If you don't want to call, don't want to give you a name, that's fine. Just, but know that the Lord loves you and continue to walk with him. Here's Terry. Still ahead, a young woman goes on the run after being accused of a crime she didn't commit. That's the story behind Terry Blackstock's newest page turner. She's going to take us inside that latest novel right after this. And welcome back to the 700 Club. A possible terror attack could be behind a temporary ban on most electronic devices for flights into the United States from eight Middle Eastern countries. Flights from Cairo, Casablanca, Morocco, Istanbul, Dubai, and Amman, Jordan are among the international restrictions. Experts say intelligence agencies might be aware of a plot in the works, like one that happened last year when a terrorist used a laptop to blow a hole in a jet taking off from Somalia. 
At least 75 people have been killed and the death toll is still rising in Peru after days of intense rains caused floods and mudslides. Thousands are now homeless. More than half of the country is under a state of emergency. Officials say the floods are the worst the country has seen in 30 years and more rain is expected to fall. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry are back with much more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. When Terry Blackstock was just 11 years old, she wrote a poem that was published in the local newspaper. From that point on, she knew she wanted to be a writer. Well, since then, Terry's unique brand of up-all-night fiction has kept millions of readers in suspense and given them hope along the way. Terry Blackstock's career took off after her first romance novel. When writing for the secular market took a toll on her spiritual life, she began writing suspense novels for a Christian audience. Today, she's a New York Times best-selling author with over 7 million copies sold worldwide. In her latest thriller, If I'm Found, Terry keeps readers on the edge of their seats as female fugitive Casey Cox is on the run, fleeing prosecution from a murder she didn't commit. Terry Blackstock is here with us now. Welcome back. It's good to have you with us. Thank you, Terry. It's great to be here. It was mentioned in that piece that you started out doing romance novels yeah. and then took a turn to suspense, which is a very different kind of writing. What was the, that journey for you? Well, I was a Christian when I went into that market, and I had gotten involved with a group of writers who were breaking into romance. Mm -hmm. and. It seemed like a great place to break into the market. And so I, I did 32 of those. I did that for 13 years. Wow. But I, you know, I, I compromised and began adding things that I never intended to mm -hmm. do in the first place. And eventually it took its toll on my spiritual life. So talk a little bit about this particular book. The latest is If I'm Found. And uh, you had me hooked last night. <laughs> I was up till the wee hours reading. Tell us about this story. Well, th this is from the If I Run series. The first book is If I Run. And it's about a female fugitive named Casey who is, she's accused of murdering her best friend. And instead of, um, you know, calling the police when she found his body, she uh, ran, did all the wrong things. And she's an unbeliever. And I'm, I'm trying to show Christianity from the eyes of an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a Christian in the book who is, a, he's the one hunting her. He's the Tommy Lee Jones character. <laughs> and, but he's a Christian, a wounded Christian. Mm -hmm. This is the second in a trilogy. There's one coming yes. out soon, If I Live, right? right? So when you have a three-part series like that, is it all in your head before you begin number one, or do you know it's going to be a trilogy? I pretty much, well, I did know this was going to be a trilogy, and I pretty much know how the arc, the story arc, is going to go for mm -hmm. the whole series but I have to figure each book out. And I, and I do want each book to stand on its own. I, so that if, someone could come in and read this exactly. without having done book number one. And right? they would still get all the information they need. And, and, uh, and of course, it's not a cliffhanger. It's a, it's a satisfying ending that takes you to the next book. Mm -hmm. It's more holding you in suspense as the answers are unraveled. You say that Casey Cox is one of your favorite characters that you've created. Why? Yeah. Well, she's very whimsical and uh, she loves people, but she's in this predicament where she has to hide. So she goes to a new community in each book and she's hiding out and yeah. she's just drawn to people. And I like to put her with Christians because then she sees new facets of Christianity that she hadn't considered before. She and the man chasing her, chasing to find her in right. the book, not in a bad way, but really seeking to help unravel this mystery in her life, both have something in common. Yes. What is that? PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. He was, in, uh, he, was, he was an army veteran and he has come back and he's now working as a private investigator to mm -hmm. find her. But he, he suffers from a, you know, a serious form of it and he, he just can't overcome it. 
And he begins to realize that she has it too, mm. because she had some incidents in her past that um, were very traumatic. And so he, that's how they begin to relate to each other. And then he begins to understand her a little better. So in writing something like this, where two of your characters now have PTSD, yeah. you must have had to do some research into I that. did. And I was, I was shocked to find that 22 U.S. veterans a day commit wow. suicide. A day? A day. And one in three coming home from the war, especially the combat veterans, mm. have PTSD. And, wow. and it, it's just shocking to know that that's happening. But there are people in the population who have it as well because they've had sure. trauma. Uh, so I got very interested in that, and I, you know, I just want to raise awareness about it. Well, when someone struggles with that, if they have a family, if they're married at all, then the whole family yes. struggles as it's, a result yeah, of it. Yeah, because they have trouble coping with life. Mm -hmm. And um, one person said they could, they go to from zero to rage in you know 60 seconds. Yeah. Um, they just can't seem to control their emotions, and they need help. And there are a lot of therapies available. There are one of the things that you say about all of the books that you write is that you want them, you want them to give hope to people yes. in the end. So how do you how do you plant that in what you're doing so that it's the end result? Well, I just try to show them that um, you know in this world you have trouble, but yeah. I have overcome the world. You know, Jesus said, and uh, Dylan learns, he kind of comes back to his faith through watching uh, Casey come to her faith. And mm -hmm. I'm kind of giving away some of book three. <laughs> but, um, but that is the story arc that um, they kind of bring each other back. And that's where true healing is found in Christ. Mm -hmm. And um, even though they, they have struggles they may need to work through together, they have a purpose now, which is mm -hmm. something they didn't have before, and that always helps. It, I read If I'm Found last night. This is the second in a three-part trilogy. When is If I Live out? Well, I just finished it. So, yeah, yeah so it's, it's uh, got to go through the editorial process, and we'll get it out as is soon as we can. Is that a couple of can. months, or what does that oh, look it's like? A, longer a little than bit that. longer, yeah. <laughs> I wish it were faster, but... You know, I took a long time writing it. <laughs> so. well, when you complete something like this, are you already off and running to the next project? Or yes. You are. Yes, I'm already. Um, I just turned that book in Wednesday of last week. And now I'm thinking about the, the next book, yeah. which I'll be, uh, it'll be a Christmas book, actually. It's going to be a romance, a Christmas romance. Did you ever have any idea? I mean, here you were wanting to be a writer with you know, the experience you had as a child, did it ever occur to you you'd have this kind of popularity? Never. Oh, no. And and when I came into the Christian market, I thought I was really reducing my market, you know, that, uh -huh. but that was, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to glorify God. And um, he has just multiplied it. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's shocking to me. <laughs> <laughs> but wonderfully shocking. Yes. Well, it's wonderful to read a book where you know the author has done her homework, and oh, this is just you. one of those. If I'm Found is a part of a trilogy. It's available in stores nationwide. Keep watching for If I Live, because that's the third one to come out. If you haven't had a chance to read the first book in the series, you can get that, and that one is If I Run. If I Run. So If I Run, If I'm Found, If I Live, all well worth your read. Terry, it's great to see you again. Thank God you. bless you. Great to have you with us. Well, still ahead, time to bring it on with questions from you, our viewers. Carmen says, my wife is obsessed with the demonic. She thinks she needs a deliverance ceremony, but I think she needs therapy. What do I do? Pat will answer that and more when we return. Now through March 31st, Enter CBN Radio's Couples Cruise Giveaway, and you and your spouse could win a cruise to Alaska, courtesy of Premier Vacations and Events. Visit CBNRadio.com for more details and to register. Well, it's time to answer your email as we bring it on today. Pat, this first one comes from Carmen who says, my wife suffers with a lot of fear. She's convinced that it's demonic and she needs to be delivered. She tells me she's not possessed, but she is demon obsessed and she wants to find someone to pray deliverance over her. She's starting to scare me. 
there are a lot of friends that, frauds out there, and I'm concerned she might engage with the wrong people. My feeling is that her thinking is screwed up, and she needs counseling rather than a ceremonial deliverance. Please help. I'm very distressed about this. Well, you know, there's really no way sitting on a television set that I can say what's wrong with your wife. But <clears throat> I have encountered, <laughs> excuse me, people who, I remember one woman from the islands who wanted to play like she was demon possessed and she was having all these voices and stuff. And I said, you know, come on, you're not demon possessed. Stop it. You're just trying to show off. And, uh, but I've also run into people who were yes, demon possessed. Were. Absolutely. Demons are real. But the Bible says, if you pursue evil, evil will come to you. And the last thing you need to do is to start chasing after demons. Uh, I mean, you know, she really will get demon possessed and it will be horrible. But, uh, you know, and also there's nothing worse than having a fake deliverance where uh, you, you try to cast out a demon and the demon didn't come out because there wasn't one. I mean, there's so many frauds. Don't get caught up in this thing. You are absolutely right. Get some sound psychological counseling on that one. If it's demons, I, I understand demons. I've dealt with them, but I, I just think chasing demons is not a, a thing that most of us want to get involved in. All right. Okay, this is Nancy who says, can everyone speak in tongues or is it a gift that only some Christians get to have? My Christian friend says not everyone has the gift and when someone speaks in tongues, they always need an interpreter or it's not from God. She doesn't believe in words of knowledge and says if someone is claiming to be a seer or a prophet, it's not from the Bible. What do you think I should say to her? Wow. Well, I tell you all to tell her to read the Bible to start with. I mean, they don't understand the Bible. Uh, read, uh, what is it, 12th chapter, 1 Corinthians, mm -hmm. and, and other uh, chapters that deal with this, the, the gifts of the Spirit. But uh, the, the, their, their charismata, uh, their, their grace gifts that the Lord gives, and uh, <clears throat> their various manifestations of the Holy Spirit, and no, not everybody brings messages in tongues. Not everybody has prophecies. Not everybody has the word of knowledge. Uh, God divides severally as he wills, what the Bible says. And uh, no, you don't have to be a seer or a prophet in order to be moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Read, to some are given a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. And, you know, there's also wisdom like Solomon. He had, he had practical common sense. But uh, this is a teaching that I haven't got time to get into all of it. But there needs to be an understanding. The Lord wants us all to move in the Holy Spirit. He wants us, uh, you know, and Paul said, but I, I'd rather speak, you know, 10 words in, in an understanding than 10,000 words in a tongue if you can't understand it. And... But no, you can speak in tongues in a private prayer language. You don't have to have an interpreter. Uh, if you speak in a congregation and bring a message, there's supposed to be somebody who can interpret it in the vernacular. There's so, a bunch of rules, but you haven't got them all, so I recommend you read the Bible very carefully, and it all sets it out there. All right. Okay, this is Stephanie who says, My sister is hurting in her heart. Her husband cheated on her, and then they got a divorce. She wants a big sign from God that it's okay to remarry and move on. But she's read the Bible and quotes parts where it says she can't remarry unless her husband dies, even if he disowns her. Please help. Uh, Jesus says that if anybody uh, divorces and gets remarried, except for the cause of ad adultery or fornication, uh, they're committing adultery. But for the cause of fornication, that is a permissible act that breaks a marriage. Apostle Paul talked about if the uh, uh, unbelieving spouse dies, the believer is not bound. But that's a totally different thing. That has nothing to do with him or her committing adultery. It's just the fact that, you know, they're separated, they're unbelievers, and then when they die, you're free. Uh, but if, if there's been an act of adultery, that marriage is broken. So you don't have to sit around agonizing over the fact that your spouse is remarried and you can't remarry because the Bible says you can't. That's a misunderstanding. There's so many people that misunderstand the Bible. It's very clear what it says. All right. 
This is Natalie Pat who says, can there be any regrets whatsoever in heaven according to the Bible? Uh, he's going to wipe all tears from their eyes. No, there won't be any regrets. Why would there be regrets? You, you're going to be, again, you'll be caught up into the glory of God, the glory of God. You'll be a spiritual being, and the former things are passed away. All things have become new. It's going to be a brand new world, a brand new existence. Well, we leave you with today's power medic from Psalm 34. Those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Well, tomorrow, we got one top doctor revealed how you can, what is it, age proof your, your life Dr. on Royce. your birthday, he, he's, no less. <laughs> yeah, I missed my birthday, and it'll, I, I'm going to, uh, oh boy. We're going to age proof you. <laughs> I'll get age proof, so I'll go to 100. Dr. Royce will be here. We'll see you later. God bless you. <laughs>